Tanya Coventry Strader. Tanya is a purpose-driven social impact and communications leader and the executive director of Mothers and Others for Clean Air. After a corporate career that included executive roles at Time Warner, Carter's, and Build-A-Bear Workshop, she founded Brand Plus Purpose, a consultancy helping companies define and articulate and activate their purpose by aligning their values, culture, and brand equity with UN SDGs. Tanya has also worked with nonprofits, including Habitat for Humanity, International, the Carter Center, NRDC, Westside Future Fund, and Committee for Common Ground, helping them develop mutually beneficial partnerships with corpor corporates, creating effective global campaigns, and launching fundraising events. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you so much. Happy to be here. You can flip to the next slide. Uh, Mothers and Others for Clean Air is an advocacy organization um, based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Um, we were founded by two moms almost 20 years ago now who were realizing that uh, asthma rates in children in Georgia were among the highest across the United States and our air pollution um, rates were just as high. Um, and they wanted to do something about it. So we've been uh, working uh, around children's health issues for 20 years now and advocating for cleaner air policy. Um, and uh, electric and clean school buses is um, mainly what we do right now because of these wonderful um, opportunities for funding that the EPA um, is bringing to schools across the country. Um, the work that we do and how we can help uh, you as school systems is um, education. Uh, we work with physicians and healthcare workers in uh, every region of the state of Georgia to um, educate, whether it be um, public policy makers, school administrators, school boards, parent organizations, community-based organizations. Um, we educate them about the intersection between um, uh, air pollution and healthcare. Um, we also empower them to become advocates in their own communities. Um, and then finally, we bring together all the resources that school systems need um, to successfully um, advocate for, apply for, and then um, implement clean transportation transitions in their school systems. So the things that we can't do, we have partners like a lot of the people here on this conference call that we can bring together um, to help um, schools with everything that they need to apply for these grants and, um, and transition their fleets. Next slide, please. Uh, the key things that we're gonna be talking about today uh, are um, diesel emissions, also called traffic-related air pollution or TRAP, and how it harms health. Um, one of the biggest reasons that our focus is on children is that they're still developing. Their bodies are growing, their organs are growing, and um, unfortunately, um, exposure uh, to emissions is cumulative, and so the younger children are going to have exposure longer in their lives and it's going to impact their bodies more because their bodies are still growing. Um, but air pollution affects all of us in many, many ways. It affects our lungs, our brain, our heart and cardiovascular conditions. And it also affects um, school performance and mental health. Um, however, the hope is there. And um, we've also found in studies that tackling um, these early exposures um, creates almost immediate health benefits. Next slide, please. Um, this is a story um, that we like to share. This young girl, um, her name was Ella Kissy Deborah. Uh, she lived in South London in an area um, with a lot of roadways, a lot of transportation. She was a very healthy and energetic little girl until she was about seven years old when she came down with very severe asthma. Um, 
the next two years, um, she was in the emergency room and checked into the hospital about 30 times with very severe um, asthma attacks. And um, unfortunately, she died at the age of nine um, because of this condition. Um, the coroner who completed her death certificate um, saw that there was something unusual about her case, and he hired a medical expert to look at her uh, medical records um, specifically. And this expert noticed that every time that Ella was in the hospital was aligned with a time when there was um, high rates of traffic and traffic pollution where she lived. Um, and as a result of that, there was an inquest and Ella was the first person to have air pollution cited as a cause of death on her death certificate. Um, this is really important because Ella's mom was never told that there was a, a correlation between her daughter's condition and the pollution um, that she was breathing. She was never made aware that um, because of this, you know, if she would move Ella away and out of that high pollution area, Ella's um, outcome might be better. So um, we just, uh, Mothers and Others for Clean Air finds it very important to make sure that everyone understands that there is a direct connection between uh, children's health and um, diesel emissions in particular, but pollution in general. Next slide. Um, why is it important to talk about health in the context of air pollution? Um, air pollution created from burning fossil fuels like diesel um, creates two things, greenhouse gases, which cause um, extreme weather and climate change. And they also uh, contain soot, ground level ozone, nitrous oxide, and volatile organic uh, chemicals. So the first group creating extreme weather and climate change causes indirect effects on our health because as we have seen recently, and, and we discussed at the very beginning of this call, our climate is changing and all of these um, changes to our environment and our climate have a very direct effect on um, our health and well being. Um, whether it be displacement, um, the spread of disease, anxiety, stress from being displaced, um, or even um, as people begin to rebuild the mold that um, takes, takes um, over houses once they've been wet and warm for a while. These are all things that will really impact um, our health. Um, there's also direct danger to um, young children and teens playing sports outside because of the extreme heat, like the heat that we experience this summer, um, people who work outdoors, and more vulnerable, vulnerable populations like children and the elderly are also um, much more sensitive to the extreme heat that we've been experiencing. Um, and then back to uh, the soot and ground level ozone, um, short term effects of this, um, and, and we've seen some of this not from diesel, but from um, the biolab plant accident that just happened in um, in Georgia about a week ago, people have been showing up with throat irritation, headaches, their eyes are burning, they have difficulty breathing. Um, and then in the long term, all of this affects the respiratory system, the circulatory system, and can cause neurological damage. Next slide, please. Um, how are we exposed to diesel exhaust? Um, mainly through sources of uh, transportation, air pollution, or trap, as I said. Um, today, we're really talking about um, diesel school buses. Next slide, please. Uh, diesel contains many pollutants that damage our health, including 40 known carcinogens. Um, some of them are greenhouse gases and nitrogen oxides and volatile organic uh, chemicals react with each other and oxygen in the presence of heat, which we have a lot of, and sunlight to create ground level ozone. And then PM 2.5 particles, which is what soot is made of, are tiny particles of um, 
carbon and other things that attach to them. And those can be inhaled in our lungs. And some of them are so small that they can go into our bloodstream. And these are dangerous because other dangerous, those carcinogenic um, pollutants attach to those carbon particles and are carried into our bodies. Next slide, please. Um, the other thing that I wanna make sure that um, we're all talking about and aware of is the fact that communities of color bear an unfair burden from this pollution. Um, there are study after study, um, but um, as we all know, um, many urban areas were uh, redlined um, in the 1930s, meaning that communities were separated um, and um, identified um, in the 30s. And then there was um, structural racism and systemic racism that went into deciding where to place roadways, where to place polluting um, industries. Um, and these were very close to neighborhoods where there were um, people of color or um, uh, poor, you know, white neighborhoods. Um, structural racism is still affecting communities of color 80 years later, um, and that's 50 years after redlining was um, was stopped and um, made illegal. Um, we have many studies about this, but one of them that we find very interesting, um, and for those of you who are um, nerds and want to um, research any of this, uh, we have a resource page on mothersandothers.org where we have all of these studies. So you can go in and take a deep dive and uh, read about them yourselves, um, or you can reach out to us and we can help you find appropriate um, studies so that you have the data behind um, all of this information. This particular study was done in the San Francisco uh, Bay Area um, in Oakland and San Francisco in around 2017, 2018, 2019. Um, a local organization there did very hyperlocal mobile monitoring over a long period of time all across that whole area. And what they realized is that communities of color have up to 55% more exposure to nitrous oxides than white communities. And that air pollution give, can vary as much as 800%, even at different ends of the same block. So if you're on a block, one end of that block is close to a roadway, the other end is not. If you put a stationary monitor on the end that's not close to the roadway, you don't understand or you can't see the data that the other side of that um, block is actually experiencing much more pollution. So this was a very um, interesting study and has been used um, across different cities and urban areas um, to try to um, encourage more mobile monitoring of um, air pollution. And, you know, the findings are speak for themselves. Next slide, please. How are children exposed to diesel exhaust inside school buses? People all the time are like, well, I see the, the puff of smoke coming out the back and it's so nasty. What they don't realize is that um, in particularly in the older diesel school buses, um, of which Georgia has a lot still on the roads, um, diesel comes out the tailpipe and also from the engine crankcase on the other end of the bus. And it seeps up through the bus and is pulled through the bus. So children inside that bus can be exposed to four to 15 times the level of um, exhaust and diesel emissions inside the bus as a child who might be riding in a car behind the bus or next to the bus would be exposed to because of the way um, buses are structured. Next slide, please. Uh, what does pollution do to children's health? As we talked about, children are growing and developing. Um, this can affect children even in utero, so it can lead to low birth weight, um, premature birth, brain development, and autism. There was actually a study done, um, interestingly, in New York City where mothers who were exposed 
to um, air pollution in the city as a natural course of their day were followed along with women who weren't exposed to traffic air pollution and the children of the mothers who were exposed to, tra to traffic emissions during their pregnancy had about five points lower IQ at the age of five than the other children did. Um, so this is, you know, very much out there and has been studied and continues to be studied, but um, the data is there. Um, air pollution also, as we all know, because if we've been in a bus, we might have coughed or felt tightness in our chests or um, seen children pulling out their inhalers, but air pollution causes asthma and asthma attacks. It can damage and impede lung growth. Uh, air pollution also um, affects adults' health. Um, so this, this is particularly relevant to those of you in school systems who have bus drivers, technicians, um, and also teachers, teachers who are waiting outside the school with buses idling nearby um, are exposed to um, a good deal of emissions. Um, and this can cause um, heart disease, um, high blood pressure, diabetes, several different types of cancers, all kinds of respiratory issues, including um, asthma and um, COPD and even neurological issues like strokes and uh, dementia and um, anxiety, like more use of mental health care. Um, just, just to give you a little bit of um, information though on that element of hope I talked about, um, Georgia State University did a study across all of Georgia um, and uh, they studied school districts that were retrofitted with um, filters to clean that diesel uh, emissions out of the inside of the school bus. Um, and when they retrofitted their entire fleet, meaning children were no longer exposed to those diesel emissions inside the buses, um, there was a 4% increase in their aerobic capacity for the entire district, which is a lot. This is like impressive finding. Um, that is a lot of lung damage that was avoided because of these um, these filters. So this, these things can be reversed. Um, that district also had improved English test scores um, to the point where uh, it made the kind of difference that it makes. And those of you in education will understand the difference between a brand new teacher who's just graduated from college and a teacher who has five years of experience teaching, um, that was the, the type of um, test scores that were reflected. Um, it also improved math scores somewhat, but the English scores were much more conclusive. Um, this was another study um, in Florida um, and they looked at children who were coming from one single elementary school. Um, and then half of those children were moved to a school where they were very close to um, a heavily trafficked roadway. And half of them were moved to um, a school district or a school where there wasn't as much traffic. And um, if their new school was downwind of a major highway, meaning that the emissions were blowing towards the school, students had decreased test scores, more absences, and more behavior problems. Um, and you know, the higher the emissions um, and the pollution on the highway, the more this difference um, happened. Um, so as you can see, um, children in um, these more urban districts and rural districts that are very close to roadways and or transportation hubs and are um, exposed to additional emissions in addition to the diesel fumes that they're exposed to in their buses, you know, their outcomes educationally are really being affected um, by diesel. Um, this is uh, yet another uh, study 
I don't need to go through it. I think we're probably running a little short on time. Um, but just so you know, there are many, many studies um, done across the country by many different organizations and academics um, who find, and I think this one was actually done by um, the EPA um, because they were studying which school buses it made the most sense to replace first. And what they realized was they could have a really big impact on children's educational outcomes if they replaced the oldest um, diesel school buses first. Um, so finally, there is hope. I know there was a lot of doom and gloom in my presentation, but um, you know, those are things we have to think about. And I thank you for being on this call and, and watching this webinar and, and trying to learn about how you can improve um, the uh, quality of the air that your students are breathing and that your um, staff and, um, you know, bus technicians and everyone is breathing across, across your transportation department. Um, Thanks to the EPA and all the people here, we are making great strides in cutting the levels of diesel emissions and pollution in the Southeast. Um, it's gonna take us all, it takes um, everyone put, pitching in to make these changes, but those changes, the impact is almost immediate. As soon as you cut that pollution in the diesel, the health impacts are very quick. So um, thank you for, um, being here, learning about this, and considering transitioning your fleet to electric. Thank you all.